It's wonderful to be with all of you. Hello, bonjour, good afternoon, good evening. Ramadan Kerim to those who are marking the holy month and many thanks to the organizers at Simon Fraser University Department of Sociology and Anthropology for inviting me to talk about this very important topic and to all of you for attending. I have to say it's really wonderful for me to have this opportunity to take part in a women's human rights conversation across North America and beyond. And I think it's a really important way to remind ourselves that our concern for women's rights globally and for the situation of women in Afghanistan in particular should last all year and can't be confined just to March 8th with its important uh, observation of International Women's Day. So with that, let me put up a PowerPoint and introduce my topic. And so um, I hope by now you are seeing uh, the, the PowerPoint and please let me know if, if you're not. Uh, so what I want to do today is to speak with you about an article uh, that I wrote uh, that was published as was mentioned in the kind introduction in the Columbia Human Rights Law Review in December 2022 with the title that you see on the screen, The International Obligation to Counter Gender Apartheid in Afghanistan. What I'm going to do is to provide some explanation of how and why I wrote this paper and an overview of the argument, and then discuss some of the recent developments in the field. Uh, and then most importantly, I look forward to your questions and comments and to the discussion. So maybe I should start by addressing why I became interested in this topic, why I wanted to write about this issue, uh, why I started working on Afghanistan in the first place. Um, for me, it, they're both sort of personal and professional reasons uh, for this. Uh, personally, I am an Algerian American human rights lawyer, and a lot of my interest in the situation in Afghanistan was actually sparked by my Algerian father's experiences in the 1990s in his home country, in the face of the rise of extremism there, uh, and the rise of fundamentalist armed groups uh, like Algeria's armed Islamic group at that time, which was sort of the so-called Islamic state of that era and uh, killed somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000 uh, Algerians. And some of the worst jihadist fighters that were battling against the state uh, were colloquially, colloquially at that time called by Algerians the Afghans because they had gone and fought uh, in Afghanistan in the late 80s and 90s in the sort of US and Pakistani and Saudi uh, sponsored uh, so-called jihad against uh, first the Soviet Union, uh, but then really against you know other uh, Afghan groups. Uh, and I was really struck by that connection between the two country situations. Uh, and I was also struck by the fact that in Algeria in the 90s, so many people, including my father, were risking their lives to speak out against extremism on the front lines, and they got very little attention, and they got very little international support. Uh, and so a lot of my career since that time has been uh, focused on working uh, with and trying to support and amplify the voices of those today who are doing what my father and his colleagues were doing in Algeria back in the 1990s, that is, are peacefully working to counter uh, extremism on its many front lines in the world today. And so I've worked on Afghanistan off and on over about 25 years, uh, traveling there first in 1996 on an Amnesty International fact-finding mission going back for another Amnesty uh, mission in 2005 after the overthrow of the Taliban, and most recently in 2011 for my own academic research. And I have to say across all of these trips, I encountered the most dedicated women's movement really that you can find anywhere in the world. Uh, and one of the sad things is that their work has been highlighted internationally when it was convenient for other reasons, and then when it was inconvenient, uh, overlooked. I also, when I was the UN Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights, I worked on, as many people uh, did, uh, the evacuations uh, from Afghanistan as the Taliban were taking over in August of 2021. In my case, because I was the Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights, focusing on cultural workers who were very much 
much uh, at risk, uh, and also uh, women human rights defenders. And I was deeply frustrated by the international failures uh, during the evacuations, uh, sometimes even sort of governments that were very responsible for the way the situation had unfolded, referring us to civil society to try to get even some of their own partners uh, that they had worked closely with evacuated. And so really that brings me to writing this article because my goal with this project was to try to find a way to enhance international responses to ensure that international responses to the Taliban are in accord with international law, to find a way to make sure that the international community could not simply walk away from its obligations to Afghan women just by leaving the country. And given the fact that there's really a lack of relevant standards on second state responsibility in most of international human rights law itself, I turned to this construct of gender apartheid as a means of achieving this goal. Now, I should say this is not a concept that I invented. I was really following in a certain feminist and human rights uh, tradition. The first person to raise uh, the issue of the concept of apartheid applying to the Taliban in the United Nations system is the person you see on the screen. This is Abdel Fattah Amor from Tunisia who was at that time in the 90s, the special rapporteur of, on freedom of religion or belief. Uh, and I think it's no accident that the first person to use this apartheid framing in the UN system uh, was himself from a Muslim majority country. And in the case of Tunisia, one with a relatively uh, liberal approach to women's human rights. He looked at what was happening on the ground in Afghanistan during the Taliban's so-called 1.0 rule, and he recognized that this wasn't just a question of religion or culture. This was really a question of fundamentalist politics and political choices about the subordination uh, of women. And women's movements in North Africa, in Iran, in a number of places uh, in the 90s, and even going back as far, I'm told, as the late 80s, uh, had been using this concept. So again, I think uh, no accident that he's the first person to use this in the UN system. But what didn't happen in the 90s, unfortunately, is the international community as a whole really did not uh, follow this very important uh, human rights leadership and framing. And what I'm trying to do is to facilitate that happening this time by suggesting conceptual architecture within international law for analyzing and responding to this aspect of the current Afghan crisis. So the point is to get the international community to actually adopt the gender apartheid approach this time and thus hopefully be more effective in its response. I should also say in this project that I'm building on the work of feminist international law scholars from around the world, including from Canada, who since the 1990s in particular have been trying to treat the problems associated with the lack of inclusion of women's experiences of human rights violations uh, in international norms and in their interpretation. I'm very happy to talk much more about that in the Q&A if that is of interest. So in terms of methodology, to achieve the objectives uh, that I was trying to reach here. My article draws from the academic literature uh, and from the international norms and jurisprudence on women's equality and on racial apartheid. But it also draws, perhaps unusually for a professor of human rights law, uh, on a series of 17 interviews that I conducted remotely with Afghan women human rights defenders. Uh, I will refer to them as WHRDs, which is the acronym we use. Uh, so I did this these interviews between September of 2021 and February of 2022. And it was very important to me, this was a very diverse group ethnically in terms of region of origin um, and fieldwork I think isn't done often enough uh, in my area. It's nice to talk to sociologists and anthropologists because I know that for many of you, this is the backbone of what you do. And my view is really that these methodologies can make a critical contribution to human rights law scholarship, bringing together theory and practice. And in relation to Afghan women, the hope also is that this methodology moves away from the much criticized so-called savior narratives by making, making trying to make sure that Afghan WHRDs are not just objects of this work, but participants in it uh, whose views help to inform it. And I'm very grateful to my Afghan interlocutors without whom I could not have done this work.
So I am going to uh, address, uh, if I have time, actually six questions related to the paper. We'll see how we go. We may save some of them for the Q&A, as well as providing an update on the most recent uh, developments. And so you see uh, these questions on the screen, starting with what is gender apartheid? What is the added value of this approach? What do we learn from the South African experience combating apartheid? What are some of the policy implications of applying a concept like gender apartheid in a context like Taliban-controlled Afghanistan? Is so what is claimed to be culture uh, an excuse for violations of this nature? And finally, what is the way forward? What interpretive and other strategies uh, do we need uh, to sort of realize this approach? So let me begin with, in some ways, the easiest question, what is gender apartheid? So in my academic work, I define gender apartheid as a system of governance based on laws and or policies, which imposes systematic segregation of women and men, and may also systematically exclude women from certain public public spaces and spheres. It involves, as you see on the screen, systemic oppression of women, really defining women as one of the Afghans I interviewed said as being, quote, not as human as men. And in this way, uh, it mirrors in many respects the experience of black South Africans under the apartheid regime in that country. Uh, This is a concept I'm really adapting from the international law on apartheid, which focuses on the late 20th century, the second half of the 20th century experience uh, with racial apartheid. Uh, And the sort of point of this concept is to emphasize the ways in which systematic discrimination has actually become the system of governance itself. And so this easily fits into uh, the definition that we can borrow from the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court of apartheid if you add gender alongside uh, race, as the UN Special Rapporteur on Afghanistan recently suggested uh, could be an appropriate way of understanding it. Uh, And you end up then with the definition of gender apartheid as being inhumane acts committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one gender group over any other gender group and committed with the intention of maintaining that regime. And I I have to say that South African uh, legal scholars have played an important role in suggesting the adding of gender to this uh, definition in the work of people uh, like Penelope Andrews, the first black woman to be the dean of a law school in South Africa uh, on this question was very important influential uh, for me. So what we're seeing now is that since uh, 2021, uh, 2022, Uh, when my article came out, when things first started to deteriorate in Afghanistan, uh, there have been huge strides made in recognizing the concept of gender apartheid and its application to uh, Afghanistan amongst other uh, contexts. And this has all happened really due to the leadership and tenacity of in particular Afghan and Iranian women on the ground and in the diasporas and very uh, grateful to them for their advocacy uh, efforts often at great risk. So I turn now to the next and closely related question. Uh, There are many country situations in which women human rights defenders have used the concept of gender apartheid to describe at least parts of the system or the political forces that they're battling. Uh, These include everything from Iran to Yemen to Saudi Arabia uh, to Israel with the rise of the religious right in that country. Uh, However, I really view Taliban Afghanistan as the sort of archetypal example of gender apartheid because of the scale of the exclusions. So my work focused primarily uh, on this example, but happy to talk about the application in other places. So this brings me to the next question. How does the current situation in Taliban-controlled Afghanistan constitute gender apartheid? So you see a list of exclusions there on the screen, and I actually couldn't fit all of them on one PowerPoint slide. Today, what we see is that the Taliban have systematically excluded women from most aspects of public life, 
just as they did in the 1990s. And this should be no surprise to anyone. Uh, this is what Afghan women human rights defenders were telling the international community would happen uh, if the Taliban uh, came back to power. Uh, and we, we were all assured uh, by certain governments and by the media in that moment of August 2021 uh, that there was a new Taliban, so-called Taliban 2.0. And in fact, what Afghan women find is their sort of starting from uh, scratch all over again. They're back to uh, the 1990s. And some say, in fact, this version of Taliban rule is even worse because the Taliban have a much more sophisticated uh, technological capacity, which they can also use to enhance their repression now. So what has happened? Since August of 2021, in well over 65 decrees, and the exact number of decrees is controversial, uh, so I'm saying well over uh, 65, uh, we have seen exclusions across all the spheres you see listed. So education, women and girls excluded from university and secondary schools. And in fact, here the Taliban are really quite unique. They are the only governing group in the world today to have systematically excluded most women and girls from education. Uh, they did this in the 20, late 20th century, their first rule, they're doing this again now, no surprise. Employment. Women have been banned from working for national and international non-governmental organizations. In violation of the UN Charter, they have been banned from working for the United Nations itself. They have been dismissed from jobs with the government. And we have to understand this is all happening in a country full of war widows and in the middle of one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world. So the impact is compounded. Health. The Taliban have banned birth control and are enforcing the ban by threatening uh, pharmacies and midwives, and they're doing this in a context where women have limited access to medical care because the apartheid restrictions also apply in the healthcare field. The Taliban's deputy health minister has said that only women doctors can treat women. Now, think of the long-term implications of this since so many women and girls are being denied the right to education. So over time, there won't be new uh, women uh, doctors and healthcare workers. Women have also been denied medical care if they seek it without the presence of a male chaperone. Freedom of movement. The Taliban have banned driver's licenses for women. They have banned travel longer than 45 miles without a male legal guardian being with a woman. They have banned solo taxi rides for women in certain contexts. And one Taliban leader actually encouraged women that they should just stay home unless there's some urgent reason for them to leave the house. Imagine your horizons being so forcibly limited. Recreation. Women have been banned from parks, gyms, public baths. They can't participate in sports, women and girls. They can't go to national parks. Imagine that. Even women's beauty salons, which were sort of the last public gathering places for women, have now been shuttered, also throwing more women out of work. Legal life. So the Taliban spokesman, when they first came to power, suggested the dismantling of basically the entire legal structure uh, that had started to be uh, built to protect women's rights uh, after the Taliban were overthrown the last time, including the abrogation of the 2004 constitution, which guarantees equality, the 2009 law on the elimination of violence against women. Uh, and these laws had been hard fought. Uh, the women human rights defenders worked very hard uh, to see them enacted. The Taliban also got rid of mechanisms for women's protection, such as the Ministry of Women's Affairs, which, as we know, is now the Ministry of Vice and Virtue, which is actually involved in the repression of women rather than uh, defending their rights. Uh, and then uh, in terms of human rights defenders, just like with racial apartheid, the women engaging in protests against apartheid policies face arrest, torture, ill treatment, incommunicado detention, and they're sometimes even arrested along with members of their family, uh, including their children. So we just see the totality of these exclusions, restrictions, limitations, uh, and forms of oppression. And I think it was absolutely correct when the German foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, characterized this as the biggest violation of, on earth of women's rights. The point here is that the international response needs to be commensurate with this catastrophic reality on the ground.
Uh, and I think that is one of the core arguments here, uh, supporting the gender apartheid approach. This, uh, you see this artwork by an anonymous Afghan girl artist. This is what it feels like uh, to young women on the ground. Imagine losing all of your rights, not really being able to leave home, not being able to be in public places, not being able to participate in political life, not being able to go to school, not being able to go to work. Uh, some women have described this as sort of death in slow motion. Now, going all the way back to the interviews that I did in late 2021 uh, and early 2022, I was struck by how quickly many of the women that I interviewed already found that what was happening in their country was gender apartheid. They agreed with that characterization. As one said, because it reflects the way in which Taliban policy, quote, removes women from government and society. Uh, they also, I think, ratified this approach because they understood that the apartheid framework had been a key tool that was used in improving the lived reality of Black South Africans in the past. Now, clearly, the UN response and the international norms were only one component of those successful anti-apartheid initiatives, which also took place in a very different international climate. But the UN response and the international norms contributed to the ultimate success of the efforts to end racial apartheid uh, beginning in 1990. And the point here, I think, is that international law should learn from its successes, especially in light of the international policy failures that created this situation. This is an internationally created problem. It requires an international uh, solution. So let me just recap quickly. How did Afghanistan get here? Uh, there are many, many things that could be said about that, and I don't have time to do justice uh, to all of this topic. But let me just say a couple of things. One is that the seeds of extremism in Afghanistan were planted in the 1980s with tremendous uh, outside support for that to happen. So after the Soviet Union invaded the country illegally, uh, then in the context of the Cold War, the United States and its allies in Pakistan, uh, Saudi Arabia, the UK, uh, and elsewhere, uh, supported the fight against that invasion, which was in, in many respects, of course, a, a legitimate fight after an illegal invasion. The problem was that they supported some of the most extremist groups that were participating uh, in that, a group uh, like Hizbi Islami, led by Gulbuddin uh, Hekmatyar. A and this really greatly increased uh, the, the problem of fundamentalism and extremism, spread it actually across uh, the region, uh, and there have been terrible consequences uh, for people on the ground, uh, for people in other places uh, as well. So very important to remember, this is a problem that was created with tremendous international contribution to the problem. The solution requires it as well. We're not doing Afghans of favors here. Uh, we are supporting them in resolving a problem uh, that was created across uh, their borders. It's also worth reminding ourselves of what has been lost here. There was substantial progress that was made for Afghan women after the overthrow of the Taliban in 2001, the first time they were in power. Now, I rush to say this progress was not equally enjoyed by all women and serious threats to women's rights persisted. But Increasing numbers of girls went to school between 2001 and uh, 2021. Maternal mortality, which previously had been one of the highest rates in the world, plummeted. Uh, women human rights defenders fought very hard to create a nascent legal and institutional framework to protect uh, women's human rights. And it is all of that progress then that is shattered uh, when the Taliban returned to power. Uh, now, how did they return uh, to power? Well, uh, during that too is a very big topic, but I'll just say a few things. Uh, during the Trump administration in the United States, uh, the Taliban successfully used negotiating for peace as a weapon of war, and they were rewarded with the Doha Agreement. And it was very disappointing to see international actors willing to set aside women's rights, willing to set aside UN Security Council resolutions on women, peace and security that they had voted for, while sort of mouthing platitudes about empowerment. 
Uh, and so the Taliban really benefiting from one-sided prisoner releases that liberated their fighters, benefiting from international negotiations that were designed often to exclude the uh, elected Afghan government, to exclude women, uh, and benefiting from the demoralization of the Afghan government's forces due to massive numbers of casualties. The Taliban's conquest of territory accelerated. Uh, and I think political will internationally was collapsing as fast as that acceleration uh, was happening. And Kabul itself ultimately fell to the armed group on August 14th, 2021, 25 years after it took power the first time. And as we know, this led to uh, sort of mass attempts to flee the country, uh, foreign countries prioritizing the evacuation of their uh, own citizens. And I think all of this was the logical conclusion of a policy that had actually started much earlier, uh, as early as I remember uh, 2013, for example, voices from within the State Department at that time during the Obama administration talking about something called reconciling with the, quote, moderate Taliban as the United States sought a way out of Afghanistan. Uh, and so this thesis about the sort of newly moderated uh, Taliban uh, was one that was sold to accompany these events. And I think it's really instructive to contrast that term with the views of Afghan women human rights defenders themselves, who were very clearly sharing these views, trying to share these views with anyone who would listen. Uh, and I remember what a prominent Afghan uh, woman advocate told me in Kabul in 2011. She said, if if they are moderate, then why they are Taliban. Uh, and another uh, woman human rights defender who I interviewed for this article, Zubaida Akbar, expressing real frustration at this narrative of the changed Taliban that was used by some governments and even by some aid organizations that wanted to work with the group, as she said, without thinking of the human cost of this. Uh, and so even the New York Times, for example, opened up its op-ed pages uh, in February 2020 to a UN-sanctioned Taliban leader, Sirajuddin Haqqani, to claim that his organization had just been acting in self-defense with no recognition of its atrocities or its role in terrorism against Afghans. Uh, and really interesting to look at some of the work coming from Muslim-majority countries and scholars uh, from those regions on this issue, very different than what we were hearing in the Western media in 2021. I think here of the work of the Egyptian political scientist, uh, Mariz Tadros, and she considered this sort of narrative of the improved Taliban that was so popular in 2021 against the history of her own home country, uh, as well as the histories of Iran, Tunisia, and Turkey. And her research found that this sort of optimistic narrative about the Taliban's improving trajectory, the idea that hardliners become more malleable uh, with their ideologies as they adapt to governance, has proven to be entirely inaccurate. Uh, and she wrote that, quote, across the political spectrum of Islamist movements assuming power, whether so-called moderates or so-called extremists, the inclination once in power is to adopt a hardline ideological stance. And in keeping precisely with her analysis, so-called Taliban 2.0, when it came to power again in 2021, inaugurated an all-male interim administration featuring almost no uh, members from minorities, uh, no women, and very little governing expertise. So I think a lot of what's happening now, the, the point of what I'm saying is that a lot of what's happening now is sort of no accident. It is the direct result uh, of all of these policy choices. We also saw when the Taliban returned to power, a significant percentage of women human rights defenders were compelled to flee the country, given threats to their safety and attacks on their colleagues. And this greatly reduces the cohort of those who can raise the international alarm about the human rights impact of these policies, uh, scattering these women human rights defenders around the world. And it's been amazing to see them uh, reorganize and continue their work despite these massive logistical obstacles. Also very strong striking to me that almost all of the women I interviewed, some of whom were still in Afghanistan at that time, some of them in safe houses, but still in the country, almost every single one of them has to be outside uh, now. That is not a choice. Uh, what we see is that 
uh, protests have continued on the ground, but they are small. They are very dangerous. They're very heroic, such as some protests that took place last week on International Women's Day in several places in the country, including in Kabul, including in Balkh, and including in the northern Tahar province. And one of those protesters told the media, she said, it is very painful that a woman has no value in our society today. I think that's a very good description of what we mean by gender apartheid. Meanwhile, one of the world's worst humanitarian crises is unfolding in Afghanistan with millions facing hunger and resultant abuses, including reports of the sale of children, of girls in particular. Uh, and I think often now when the international community thinks of Afghanistan, there's a willingness to focus on the humanitarian situation, not the human rights uh, crisis. And in my view, these things are very closely tied together and you cannot uh, de-link them. Uh, the humanitarian crisis has had disproportionate impact on women due to the apartheid restrictions. And when women suffer, such as being uh, by being denied employment, their families suffer too. So the sort of spillover effects of gender apartheid on families and the population are far reaching, just as was the case with racial apartheid. And I was very struck by the statement on March 8th made by Alison Davidian, who is the representative for UN Women in Afghanistan. And she said, the space for Afghan women and girls continues to shrink at an alarming pace. And with it, Afghanistan's future prospects to escape a vicious cycle of war, poverty, and isolation. So very clearly linking the women's human rights crisis and the humanitarian crisis, which I think is absolutely uh, essential to understand. Uh, I think of what one of the women I interviewed in a safe house said to me, she said, we are being erased. And we see since I talked to her that erasure becoming more and more complete. And I think of what the British journalist Emma Graham Harrison uh, wrote. She said, Afghanistan is currently the worst place in the world to be a woman. And so as an international lawyer, I feel that if international law has no effective heightened solutions to offer here, it really will discredit itself. This time, the gender apartheid approach needs to receive the affected and concerted response that it merits to address what's happening to women on the ground. Um, and this brings me really to uh, the next question, which is, if the situation in Afghanistan constitutes gender apartheid, and I'm actually going to skip forward a couple of uh, slides here, what is the added value of the gender apartheid approach. And I will talk through uh, some of these after I've gone over a few of the building blocks to get there, some of the pieces of added value. Why make this move? So international law, just skipping back, has a paradigm for dealing with apartheid. It was developed between the 1960s and the 1980s in response to the situation in Southern Africa and really led by the dynamic commitments of decolonized states on this issue. But that apartheid framework is drafted, as you see on screen, to respond specifically to racial apartheid. Uh, and it hasn't yet been formally deployed to address gender apartheid, as I argue it should be. And that's the reason for, <laughs> sorry, my, my slides here got a little bit out of order. That's the reason for um, this slide, which is that what I'm calling for here is what a feminist scholar named Charlotte Bunch referred to as a feminist transformation of human rights, of international law. What we need to do is to reimagine the concept of apartheid, taking into consideration uh, women's human rights as well. And this is really an essential way to respond to this 21st century uh, version of apartheid. Uh, and we can really use the framework of the apartheid convention, the point of which was to concert the efforts of the international uh, community. Now, important to note that the this apartheid convention made a significant contribution by making apartheid an international crime. And no one was ever actually prosecuted for the crime of apartheid uh, because South Africa pursued a truth commission during its transition. But the convention was understood to be a critical advocacy tool for opponents of apartheid in any case. Uh, it was critical as a standard for judging other countries' responses. It was regularly cited in UN debates, and it really codified the view of the apartheid regime as an illegal situation to be ended. 
This was very much the vision that the International Court of Justice had of apartheid uh, in the Namibia case. And this is the codification of that view. It also facilitated uh, the adoption of sanctions. And it's perhaps useful to remember and remind ourselves how change was made in apartheid South Africa. So what we saw was a convergence of international political will and local political struggle. These were essential catalysts for change, and they had a dynamic synergy. The African National Congress was given observer status at the UN and carried out its own successful foreign policy. Highly publicized South African atrocities, such as the repression of the 1976 Soweto uprising, galvanized international opinion and action. Uh, and the UN response and international norms were just one component of a broader Global South-led worldwide anti-apartheid initiative. Uh, but all of this helped to create powerful advocacy tools and helped mobilize global condemnation for South African policy, which helped to break the deadlock on sanctions. And it's hard to come up with one factor that led to the ending of apartheid. But if you look at some of the scholarship by South African scholars uh, in this book uh, called Ending Apartheid, you will see that they said a precise weighting of the various factors that undid apartheid um, is, is difficult, but what can be asserted with some confidence is that the changes that occurred in the norms governing state behavior were crucial. Other governments really had to pay deference to these norms, and that made apartheid South Africa a pariah in the International Society of States. And that's what we absolutely have to do with the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, though the country situations are different, uh, the times are different, and the humanitarian crisis, of course, complicates all of this. So how then do we get from racial apartheid to gender apartheid and why? So how? After the end of apartheid in South Africa, the 1998 Rome Statute confirms that apartheid continues to be a crime and to rise to the level of a crime against humanity. The International Law Commission in 2001 recognizes that anti-apartheid norms are what's called use Kogan's norms, the highest level norms in international law. And my paper argues in favor of employing just such a vigorous approach to confronting the equally heinous practice of using discrimination against women as the governance model. And the point here too is to empower and really cajole rights respecting responses from other states and from an international community that claims to value women's human rights. Because what we're seeing is that international pronouncements in favor of equality without commensurate action really discredit the women's human rights project. And the impact of that is magnified as we see states, we see international organizations actually beginning almost to participate in apartheid by sending all male delegations to Kabul, by in some cases agreeing to work without female staff. Uh, and as some governments uh, move towards normalizing relations with the Taliban, there was even a suggestion by a particular UN Deputy Secretary General that there could be something she called principled recognition, unquote, of uh, the group. So we really have to confront this uh, normalization, especially in the face of what's happening on the ground. Now, one of the Afghan women protesters on International uh, Women's Day very bravely said to the media, our silence and fear is the biggest weapon of the Taliban. She was absolutely correct, but I would add to that list of weapons in the hand of the Taliban, international complicity and normalization. And that's why we need this concept of gender apartheid, because it's not only a factually accurate description and one that carries appropriate stigma, but it can also be a mechanism for generating some kind of global accountability for this transnationally created disaster of the Taliban's return to power. As one of the Afghan women I interviewed said, it can be a, quote, powerful mobilizing tool. Uh, there is symbolic and expressive importance of applying the apartheid concept here. It enhances what we call the mobilization of shame in the field of human rights, and I think it can do so much better than some of the alternative terms uh, that are available to describe the situation. Uh, it also puts pressure on governments, international organizations, and transnational corporations not to engage with the Taliban in ways that show tolerance for and help to perpetuate grave abuses. Just as with 
racial apartheid in South Africa. The apartheid framing strengthens the pariah status of the perpetrators and elevates the international status of the opponents of gender apartheid. Remember, the government of apartheid South Africa is ejected from the UN General Assembly and the African National Congress leading the anti-apartheid uh, movement has observer status uh, in the UN. So we need to think very creatively. Conversely, the failure to use this kind of heightened concept uh, in the face of a regime whose well-known policies are this relentlessly misogynistic sends a terrible message to women everywhere that their rights simply do not matter uh, or do not matter as much. Uh, so we really need to update the 20th century uh, apartheid framework, deploy it fully to confront uh, this situation. For example, the UN created a whole range of implementation mechanisms to respond to racial apartheid, multiple special rapporteurs, a special uh, committee, uh, extra activities for non-governmental organizations in the UN system and so on. And it, at its heart, it was a rejection of so-called constructive engagement that the Reagan administration in the United States uh, advocated with regard to apartheid South Africa. Uh, it said this is an illegal situation that has to be ended. And when the UN Special Rapporteur on Afghanistan and the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women looked at using gender apartheid in a June 2023 joint report, what they said is that apartheid framing highlights that other states and actors and the international community at large have a duty to take effective action to end the practice, as was done to end racial apartheid in Southern Africa. So that is why I think this move to a gender apartheid framing of the situation in Afghanistan is so critical. Some of the policy uh, consequences possibly include helping to maintain the sanctions on the Taliban uh, going forward, helping to resist calls uh, to have travel exemptions uh, for some uh, Taliban leaders. Uh, Ireland has heroically led on that issue in the UN, uh, but that position needs to be maintained. Uh, also, keeping the Taliban rightly out of the seat of Afghanistan in the UN while they are committing such grave violations of the UN uh, Charter scrutinizing other uh, governments and even international actors for their complicity if they seek to normalize the Taliban while the Taliban are practicing uh, gender apartheid. And I'm going to jump forward a bit here because I want to make sure we get to the discussion sooner rather than later. I won't go through these arguments in favor of codifying gender apartheid, but happy to come back to them. Uh, in the Q&A. So you may be wondering, why is it not enough to just use ordinary human rights law and anti-discrimination norms to respond to this situation? Well, I think what is key to understanding about apartheid, whether it's gender apartheid or racial apartheid, is the idea that it gives rise to a system designed to discriminate. That's the whole point. So human rights law and non-discrimination norms are important components of critiquing such systems, but they're also by themselves insufficient because the specific problem posed by apartheid is the way it upends assumptions that are built into human rights law. So human rights treaties center the state and address the state as the entity to realize equality but here, when the apparatus of the state has been captured by an entity that is mandating systematic inequality, whose laws or policies codify discrimination as the norm, this ordinary international human rights model cannot work. And that is why there's so much focus in apartheid law on second states having to take measures to suppress apartheid, uh, having heightened obligations to take action on apartheid, having heightened obligations to implement relevant uh, UN resolutions, being prohibited from aiding or abetting apartheid or being complicit in its commission. Uh, aiding and abetting have been understood broadly. For example, the International Convention Against Apartheid in Sports stresses that sports exchanges of any kind with countries practicing apartheid are ways of abetting uh, the practice. So uh, this brings me to another issue I want to sneak in before I get to uh, the update and the way forward and turn over to discussion, and that is, does uh, Afghan culture excuse discrimination against women? Uh, 
So I was the UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights from 2015 to 2022. So I grappled with these kinds of questions related to culture for a long time. I know some of you are anthropologists. You may be thinking about these uh, issues. Uh, and unfortunately, as uh, an Iranian uh, women's rights advocate, Manaz Afkami, wrote back in the 1990s, uh, Islamists have been using the argument of cultural relativity that is now in vogue in the West to deny women's rights by introducing regimes of gender segregation. Uh, and that has certainly also been the case uh, for the Taliban. So, for example, uh, the Taliban's so-called education uh, minister, whose policies deny the education uh, rights of nearly half the country, a person named Abdul Baki Haqqani, he has argued that co-education violates Islam and also what he called national values, customs, and traditions, uh, and so was not uh, possible. Now, I have to say this would be a shock to the inhabitants of every other Muslim-majority country uh, in the world where girls go do go to school uh, and in many of those countries in a co-educational uh, situation. And I have to say that such claims that Afghan cultural particularities justify discrimination were highly contested by the Afghan women human rights uh, defenders that I interviewed. Uh, I don't have time to say more about this, but there are some wonderful quotes from them uh, in the paper, uh, such as uh, one of them, Palwasha Hassan, who acerbically commented, the Taliban are claiming to reconvert an already Islamic country containing 99% uh, Muslims. But many of the others also stressing the diversity of Afghanistan uh, and the, the need for its culture not to be seen as uh, homogeneous and the need to respect uh, that diversity. And many of them claiming an equal right to interpret uh, their religion and their culture and disputing the Taliban's uh, religious claims. Also hearing from people who are not uh, religious and, and just an important reminder that the nature of all Afghans' beliefs cannot be presumed that freedom of religion or belief uh, is as essential for Afghans as for anyone else. Uh, and one of those I interviewed, uh, Yalda Royan, uh, stressing the idea that that culture is made by the people of a society. Uh, this idea of sort of agency uh, around culture, it, it's not something that should be uh, imposed. Uh, and I have to say that uh, international human rights law is absolutely on the side of Afghan women human rights defenders. It has completely rejected culture and religion as justifications for violations uh, of women's rights. And there's much more. If anybody wants to ask me in the q and I'm happy to talk uh, a lot more about this. Uh, but if you look at the UN Human Rights Committee, it is said very clearly that freedom of religion or belief cannot be relied on to justify discrimination against women. Uh, the former UN Special Rapporteur on freedom of religion of, or belief have also uh, confirmed uh, this position. And a reminder there from the UN's advisory committee, which advises the UN Human Rights Council, that really it's the most marginalized who have the most to lose from this so-called traditional values approach uh, to human rights. And I really make a plea to my colleagues in academia to think very carefully about uh, arguments in academic literature justifying cultural relativism, arguments that actually have have lethal consequences on the ground and undermine the work of uh, women human rights defenders. So uh, given all the reasons for labeling the situation in Taliban-controlled Afghanistan gender apartheid, given the fact that culture is not an excuse, and in fact, the International Court of Justice deliberately uh, considered as irrelevant the South African government's claim that racial apartheid was justified by religion uh, or culture, where are we now on uh, gender apartheid? Well, really, since uh, in the last year, I would say, we've just seen an explosion of use uh, of this concept, perhaps most prominently here, you see on screen by Grasa Michelle, uh, the widow of Nelson Mandela and an anti-apartheid icon in her own right, who said that she agreed with uh, the concept of gender apartheid. She agreed that uh, Taliban Afghanistan really fit in this category and she called for the same kind of international response uh, to end gender apartheid as was used to end racial apartheid in South Africa. We've seen a, a whole range of UN officials use this uh, term, uh, including most importantly, you see here on screen, the UN Special Rapporteur uh, and uh, the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against uh, Women. And I really commend to you their powerful uh, 
June 2023 report, South Africa speaking up in the Human Rights Council along with Namibia, supporting uh, the gender apartheid approach that was used here. Uh, Malala Yousafzai in December of 2023, dedicating her entire Nelson Mandela lecture uh, in Johannesburg to uh, applying the gender apartheid concept uh, to the situation of women and girls in Afghanistan and receiving huge support uh, in South Africa from the Nelson Mandela Foundation and uh, many others uh, for doing that. Uh, and the support has increased so much that I was actually invited to talk about this topic uh, in the UN Security Council in September. Uh, by Albania, a Muslim-majority uh, country that held the presidency at that time. And the most striking thing that happened uh, during that session was that the chief of UN women, Sima Bahus of uh, Jordan, who's not the person uh, pictured there with me, uh, but Sima Bahus of Jordan, the head of UN women, actually called on the international community to explicitly codify gender apartheid in international law, saying that the tools we currently have at our disposal were not created to respond to this kind of mass state-sponsored uh, gender oppression, uh, Albania very much uh, agreeing uh, with this. So where what do we do now? Gender apartheid is worsening on the ground, but we're seeing some increasing recognition of it internationally. And at the same time, in certain circles, uh, in certain governments, uh, even in the UN's recent assessment, we're also seeing simultaneously a push for the normalization of the Taliban. So what do we do now? And this is what I will end with. Uh, I think there are two principal ways forward. The first is we simply apply the existing apartheid convention and standards to gender apartheid. We do this very carefully with an updated forward-looking 20, uh, 21st century definition of apartheid. We have the support of the government of South Africa in doing this. And one example was a press release uh, that I did with some other UN experts back in 2021 uh, about the Taliban's ban on women and girls in sports, saying that the spirit of the convention on apartheid in sports uh, applies to the Taliban. Taliban's ban on women's sports. Uh, and so we don't wait. We start applying this framework now. The other thing that we need to do, and we need to do at the same time, is to push for the explicit codification in international law of gender apartheid. And the best opportunity to do that is around the new Crimes Against Humanity Convention that is being discussed in the Sixth Committee of the UN General Assembly. Uh, that discussion will reconvene in April. And it would be wonderful if governments uh, like the Canadian government and many others could speak up in terms of adding a gender to the definition of apartheid that is already in that convention. A number of states have already uh, spoken up for doing this, Malta uh, being sort of the gold standard uh, and talking about how codifying gender apartheid will enable victims and survivors to hold perpetrators to account for the totality of the crimes committed by systematized oppression. We need many more governments to speak out between now and the April meeting and in the April meeting and going uh, forward. Uh, but I have to say a caveat here, codification will take a long time, at least probably three to four years. So we need to use the existing law with a forward-looking interpretation now to the extent that we can. Engagement with the Taliban, which is what the UN has been trying, parts of the UN, political bodies in the UN, which is what governments, some governments have been trying, has now produced no results whatsoever except an entrenched and creeping and expanding gender apartheid. And I don't believe that engagement with the Taliban is any way forward. What we need is a galvanizing new framework. And I think one of the most promising candidates for that framework is gender apartheid. If business as usual continues, the situation will simply continue to deteriorate with devastating local and international consequences. Uh, and I really think of the words of Malala Yousafzai in Johannesburg in December during her Nelson Mandela speech. She said, it took a bullet to the head for the world to stand with me. What will it take for the world to stand with Afghan women and girls? And I think one of the best ways we can do that is to recognize and apply the concept of gender apartheid. Thank you so much uh, to, for listening, and I really look forward to your comments and your questions. Thank you so much uh, for this powerful uh, uh, presentation, Karima.
and a very uh, thought prov provoking presentation. I um, it is really thought provoking. When I was thinking, uh, listening to you, lots of number of questions emerged in my mind, <laughs> so I cannot ask all of them clearly. Uh, but I would like to ask one question, if you don't mind. And this is in relation to the political structure of global governance. Uh, this structure is, interna is the international system of states, states that sometimes competing with each other, often actually competing with each other, or sometimes allying with each other. Uh, nevertheless, the in global governance uh, structure political structure of, of global governance is international system of states. So there is a very well recognized uh, democratic deficit in this system. So um, the, what I'm thinking, if the, if the democratic deficit is persisting for a long, long time, enduring, uh, and without democratizing this uh, political structure, uh, and this democratizing of political structure requires um, struggles for global justice, right? So given that, and also given that we have, um, the, uh, especially in uh, Muslim majority societies, Islamic law oriented groups emerging as freedom fighters. And in the global north, Europe and uh, North America, we are seeing the uh, very strong mobilizations of populist, far-right, ultra-nationalist groupings. I have difficulty, not, I'm not I'm not a difficulty, but I'm struggling with this idea of how to democratize the global political structure of governance in a way that, in a way that what you're proposing uh, will have some resonance really. It's very difficult. Uh, how, how are we going to do? I mean, I'm not asking you to answer a question with a huge question, <laughs> a huge, huge question. I deal with this question in my teaching, in my publications, etc. And we are all dealing or struggling with this. But uh, what is your opinion on this? Mm -hmm. You know, that is such a big and important set of questions that you've asked. And I don't think I can claim to, to answer it, but I just have a few uh, thoughts. So... One thing to start with is the responsibility of the Security Council and the permanent members of the Security Council. And of course, we know that the Security Council is the lead political body in the UN in the field of international peace and security. It is tasked with maintaining international peace and security and that we, we know uh, that there are five uh, permanent members who have a veto power. Of course, that's made a lot of news uh, lately. And I've been thinking a lot about the need for more sustained campaigns to push the permanent members of the Security Council uh, to, to act in ways that are consonant with this huge responsibility that they are given uh, for international peace and security. And when I spoke in the Security Council, um, it was actually quite striking with a few uh, exceptions to see really the lack of clear, committed uh, political will uh, by the permanent members uh, to really address this in an effective way to do more than uh, lip service. Then you have some permanent members, of course, like Russia and China that are really moving uh, forward to uh, normalizing uh, the Taliban and seeing for themselves a range of regional security and other kinds of potential uh, benefits uh, for doing so. Uh, then you see the U.S., which has played such a role in in helping to create the situation. Uh, you know, not kind of assuming uh, the responsibility of showing the leadership in in finding the effective solutions. And I was so grateful to Albania, a non permanent member of the Security Council, for having the courage not only to invite me to, to speak about the issue of gender apartheid, but then to say uh, from the floor that it does out the government of Albania does consider that the concept of gender apartheid is appropriately applied. Uh, to uh, Afghanistan. And I think it is so important to see uh, 
empowered these kinds of constituencies, Muslim majority countries with a relatively liberal approach to uh, women's rights, countries that claim that they have a feminist uh, foreign policy. There aren't very many of them anymore, uh, but you know, even the ones that do uh, mobilizing them, countries that played a leadership role actually in confronting racial apartheid. It was not the global north that led that movement in the UN. It was the global south. It was recently decolonized sub-Saharan African countries, Caribbean uh, nations, uh, some uh, Asian uh, countries as well that played a leadership role and really calling on them to repeat that. Although, you know, I'm not naive about how much more difficult it will get, it will be to get them uh, to take up these issues. But I do think that, you know, this really needs to be uh, sort of a, a, an initiative that has support from all regions, uh, but is global south uh, led. Um, and so uh, another piece, I, I don't want to take too long because I know there are other questions, but another piece of your question is not only the democratic deficit internationally, generally, which is a huge and important set of issues, but also the deficit when it comes to the participation of women at the highest levels, the lack of women foreign ministers, the lack of women ministers of defense who are making these decisions, the lack of women ambassadors uh, in the UN system generally, um, and you know the lack of, of women, for example, in expert bodies like the UN International Law Commission, which is the expert body tasked with developing the basis for new international law. You know, there were no women on that body at all until just recently. And then I think there have only ever been a total of seven women ever, four of whom are currently there uh, serving on uh, that body. Same thing with the International Court of Justice. And so I think it is, you know, no accident then that the output of a number of these bodies has not fully included uh, women. And of course, it's not just a question of identity, right? What we need is women, men, or any anybody else participating who is committed to and has expertise on uh, gender equality. And th even though governments have said in a whole long line of UN Security Council resolutions that this is core to responding to problems of international peace and security, they don't fulfill uh, those obligations. So I, I think you're right. We have to address all of these deficits to be able to move forward, but we also don't have the luxury of waiting. That's the long-term uh, project. I think we need to take much more urgent action meanwhile, and it's difficult to do in this environment. Thanks so much. Thank you. Asli and Molly, is that your turn? <laughs> Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Vinan. This has been a really illuminating presentation, and I know we're all very grateful to have you speak to us virtually today. Um, I see that, yes, there's already a plethora of questions, so I'm just going to go kind of in order of, of how they came in, and uh, if that's all right with you. Sure. So the first one we have um, is from an anonymous uh, user, and their question is, would you say it was only uh, Hizbe is... Islami, uh, or all of the seven parties that had a part in the destruction of Afghanistan and women's rights um, on the whole? Uh, so the first thing that I should say is I was really unable to do justice to the very complex uh, history of Afghanistan uh, during the Soviet invasion uh, period and the resistance to that invasion uh, at the end of the 70s and the 80s um, and the early 90s. And I was really pointing to Hizbi Islami as a terrible example uh, of one of the groups uh, that, you know, completely opposed to uh, women's equality of any kind, committed gross abuses, and that states like the United States were still comfortable supporting. There's certainly no question about it that there are other uh, what are called Mujahideen uh, groups uh, that also played a terrible role in terms of civilian uh, casualties, in terms of uh, human rights uh, on the ground. Uh, and you know, if we had time, we could we could speak in much more detail. I mean, one of the tragedies is that for so many Afghans who lost family, once the Soviet Union then withdraws then these groups turn on each other and they basically destroy what is left of Afghanistan uh, at that point into the 90s. And often families actually don't know who killed their loved ones because different groups may have been uh, attacking uh, cities, for example, in particular Kabul, uh, and they, they, they may not even know. And one of the things that really impressed me uh, 
uh, was uh, an initiative called the War Victims Network, headed by Huria Mossadegh, uh, who I interviewed for the article. Uh, and she had tried to bring together uh, people who had been victims of all of the different warring parties uh, to try to call for accountability uh, in the period after the Taliban uh, was overthrown uh, the first time in the early 2000s. And the international community was not very interested in that. And Afghans were basically told, including by a high UN official, that they had to pick peace or justice. Uh, and I think the sad result of the lack of commitment to principle means that now Afghans actually have neither. Thank you so much for your answer on that. Um, the next question is a little bit of a, of a wider framework and considering um, the role of uh, the Taliban specifically in relation to the Olympic Games actually. Um, so this is um, from someone named Friba and they say, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm a woman from Afghanistan and I lead a nonprofit organization which empowers Afghan women and girls through education and sports. I have learned that the IOC or the International Olympic Committee hasn't banned the Taliban from the Olympic movement. The IOC is allowing the Taliban gender apartheid to enter the Olympic Games right at the heart of Europe in Paris. What kind of message does this send to the European women? I think it says a terrible message to women everywhere. I don't think it's in accordance with the principles of the Olympic movement. I know that these issues are really complicated because I also know that there is huge support, for example, for the cricket team, the Afghan men's uh, cricket team. My own view has been that as long as the women cannot play, the men should not be competing internationally either. I know that there might be many Afghans who would disagree, and I think that a movement in that regard has to be a consultative movement led by uh, Afghans. I know for some people it's a real morale boost when the Afghan men's cricket team uh, does so well it is, as it has done in recent years. On the other hand, uh, it is it is really repellent that a state uh, uh, whose current de facto uh, so-called authorities are excluding women and girls uh, from sports. So it's basically going to be fielding only male teams. All male uh, teams is allowed to participate in international athletic competition. And I can tell you that is in violation of the spirit of the convention on apartheid in sports, which applies specifically to racial apartheid, but it makes no sense to me whatsoever that it couldn't apply equally uh, to gender apartheid. And indeed it should and my suggestion, I don't think it's for non-Afghans to take the lead on this one, but my suggestion to uh, Afghan women human rights defenders would be to consider uh, some campaigning specifically on this issue because the Olympics uh, give such high visibility uh, to, to questions. So thank you very much for the questions. And if I'm not mistaken, there's in fact a movement in uh, France that has been dealing with this uh, very issue. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we have another one from Ali, and this is again more uh, so fo focused on um, Afghani women um, in Afghanistan right now. So she says, girls and women in Afghanistan want to be free to work, live and learn. Do you think the resistance and the continued work of women and men to undermine the Taliban rules is an important step to get the UN and others to support this concept? Uh, so I want to make sure I'm I'm um, understanding the question correctly, but I my my sense is sort of how important or how effective uh, is kind of frontline uh, women's yes. struggle in keeping the attention of the international community. I think yes. it's absolutely essential. I mean, these even small, one of the demonstrations on Women's Day had seven people. That's equivalent to sort of 25,000 in North America, given, you know, <laughs> the lack of uh, sort of equivalent danger and restrictions and the amount of media coverage that some of those protests uh, gets get is is really um, important. But I also know that it's increasingly dangerous uh, for women to take part in these demonstrations. And I know some of their uh, Afghan colleagues in the diaspora have been very worried for them about the security implications and thinking about um, other modes of um, struggle women protesting, for example, in private locations, things that are more uh, sort of appearing on uh, social media and so on. And I just think it's so important that the international community 
pay attention to this women's resistance. I, I have so much respect for the Afghan women protesters movement. You can follow them uh, on Twitter. Uh, Zubaida Akbar, who is one of the people I interviewed, who I think is in the Zoom, uh, is has been doing really important work in trying to make sure that their messages are amplified um, internationally. They, we should definitely see them as as the leaders, and the rest of us are figuring out, uh, you know, them and their colleagues in the diaspora, m many of whom are not in the diaspora because they chose to be as the leaders, uh, and the rest of us are trying to figure out effective ways to support them, to amplify their messages, and to make sure that the toolkit they have available uh, is full. But again they should not have to face up to this alone. As, as I said, I mean, this is a truly international uh, problem. The Taliban also have had support uh, internationally, including from uh, the neighboring government in uh, Pakistan, amongst uh, others. Uh, so while we have to respect Afghan women's leadership, and I think it has played a key role, uh, we also cannot expect them to do all of this heavy lifting uh, alone. And I, I think while it's very important to avoid some of the sort of savior narratives uh, that I talked about and so on, solidarity is vital. Um, and, you know, I saw on social media not too long ago, you don't have to be Afghan to speak up about Afghanistan. Uh, and certainly you want to be informed by the views of Afghans to do it. But I, I think that's such an important uh, message. And in the 1990s, there were some actors like the Feminist Majority and others uh, internationally who kept some of these issues alive in the, in the United States where so many of the decisions were being made um, and at the international uh, level. Uh, but there really needs to be that coordination work. Uh, and I know this model is being practiced, Canadian Women for Afghan Women and a number of other organizations uh, doing this work. And I, I just really encourage people if you're outraged by the topic we were discussing today, please do find ways uh, to, to support Afghan women human rights defenders. Invite them. Uh, if you happen to, to speak any of the relevant languages, translate what they're writing and uh, distribute it, help them uh, get published and so on. That's wonderful. Thank you. And um, I think that with the flow of the questions are kind of ebbing and flowing out of uh, localized and then a global scope again. So I hope that's OK, because um, the next question is from Amon um, and they ask, how will pow powerful actors within the UN, such as China and Russia, who are increasing economic and political relations with the Taliban, affect the process of implementing international accountability for gender apartheid? This is this is a huge problem. I mean, we 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 have governments that are really moving forward, uh, you know, wanting to open uh, embassies, um, uh, really willing to overlook the Taliban's human rights record, downplaying that record, uh, and uh, sort of obfuscating uh, in the UN. Uh, Russia very aggressively doing that when I was in the Security Council. Uh, China in a much more, as is the, often the style of the, the Chinese government, in a much more measured way, but still uh, carrying a, a message that was counter to highlighting the human rights problems and, and demanding an effective solution. Um, but unfortunately, I would also say, you know, some governments like the, the U.S. government, which has a sort of a commitment to women's human rights and makes, I think, the right statements, still not willing to take effective action. And I believe that there are powerful uh, sectors in the U.S. government that actually wish they could normalize relations with the Taliban for a whole range of reasons, uh, including uh, security, including uh, counter narcotics uh, and others. Uh, but I think in the security area, the idea somehow that working with the Taliban is, a, is in any way a, a positive measure to counter extremism is completely uh, missing the point. And a lot of the intelligence reporting is very worrying in terms of what the Taliban are allowing, uh, what kinds of uh, armed groups are now able to be present uh, in Afghanistan from, from outside of the country and so on. And uh, there's really powerful uh, Afghan uh, writing. I think of the work of uh, Nazifa Hakpal, uh, who wrote about the connections between gender apartheid uh, 
and uh, terrorism, that you really can't separate you know, these two concepts. I think there's a view that you can kind of set women's rights aside while you're focusing on extremism. Well, guess what? You know, the, the, the sort of complete rejection of women's humanity is core to the ideology and the extremist ideology uh, of the Taliban, which is part of what gives rise to its tolerance for uh, terrorism, uh, its own terrorism in the past, and uh, the presence of other groups that may engage uh, in it on its territory. So what we really need is a coherent and principled approach. And I think what we need is is accountability for all governments for the role that they play and what they do and don't do. And I'm very grateful, I have to say, the Canadian government has made some very powerful uh, statements on the situation of women in Afghanistan. And what I would like to see the Canadian government is to take that to the next step. And b before the April meeting convenes at the General Assembly in New York to speak up in favor of codifying gender apartheid, not because I said so, because Afghan women on the front lines have been demanding this. Afghan women in the diaspora, some of them even on hunger strike with this specific uh, demand for the recognition that what they're experiencing is not just sort of some anecdotal problem of discrimination. It actually is a systematized form of uh, gender apartheid. Uh, and Canada can make that statement before the April uh, meeting of the Sixth Committee at the General Assembly. It can make that statement also during that meeting and in every international uh, forum where it participates. It can use the gender apartheid framing, as Ambassador Ray has done uh, several times in the past, and it can push its allies uh, and friends to support that as well. And I, I really, anyone in Canada willing to take up that message which with your government, uh, that would be a wonderful contribution. That, thank you. That's actually a wonderful segue to the next question posed by Helen in the chat. Um, because she's saying, uh, first of all, she wants to say that she's completely blown away by this presentation. Um, and she's hoping to write a letter uh, to her, a member of parliament and anyone else in the Canadian government. Um, any, suggestion, any suggestions on who to write to in the Canadian government? I know you're, you're from the United States, but um, or any template letters that could be used as a basis for a letter writing campaign. So if you have any platforms that you know of or any ways forward with getting in touch with our local and um, federal politicians. Uh, and so I want to be a bit uh, humble about my suggestions in the Canadian context, um, because, of course, everyone based in Canada will will have more specific ideas than, than I will. I know that there are two groups in Canada that are doing this and interested in doing this, and you could also link up with them. One is the Network of Women Living Under Muslim Laws, which is an international network, uh, but it is uh, based in Canada. Uh, and the other is uh, Canadian Women for, for Afghan Women. Uh, I think critically important uh, in particular with uh, those in charge of uh, foreign policy uh, in Canada uh, to raise those issues, those in charge of uh, policy on uh, women's rights. And I would say the message should be both sort of a positive one and a push. Positive, you know, thanking and recognizing the powerful statements that have been made by the Canadian government uh, in the UN, uh, recognizing uh, the the refugees uh, that Canada uh, has welcomed, uh, and then also pushing Canada to take this to the logical next step, which is uh, the recognition of gender apartheid, and not giving in to uh, sort of the trend in among some governments of so-called constructive engagement uh, with the Taliban and continuing really to take a very uh, firm line that there can be no progress uh, in terms of any kind of, of formal uh, recognition or even certain kinds of de facto uh, recognition uh, of the Taliban until substantial uh, progress is made on a wide range of human rights um, issues. Uh, but but uh, I'd be happy to, to stay in touch about uh, the specificities you know, of that. I'm very easy to find because I'm a university uh, professor. So do feel free to, to get in touch and, and uh, follow up about that. I would say the time is now because this meeting uh, of the Sixth Committee of the General Assembly is convening on uh, the 6th of, uh, sorry, the, at the 1st of April, if I'm not mistaken. So really not that many weeks away. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm thinking we have maybe room for one or two more questions. Is that okay, time-wise? 
Yes. We, we have quite a few. Okay. <laughs> so I just so want to inundate you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so this next one we have is, is from Rajdeep. And she says, uh, hi, Karima. Thank you so much for your amazing talk. I'm wondering, how did the Muslim majority countries around Afghanistan react to the reemergence of the Taliban? And second part of the question, do, you, do they take a stance at all on what is happening to Afghan women or do they leave it alone as a mainly Afghan issue? Uh, so that's that's a great question. Um, I would say, you know, it really depends which of the neighboring countries we're talking about. Uh, Pakistan, the government of Pakistan uh, has been very close to the Taliban, I think has seen the Taliban as a useful uh, ally in a range of ways. That has actually had tragic consequences for Afghanistan and also for Pakistan. And now if we see the increase in uh, violence by some of the jihadist groups inside Pakistan, uh, you know, that is sort of unfortunately tragically coming home to roost. There's been tremendous support for Afghan women and Afghan human rights defenders uh, from Pakistani civil society, human rights groups uh, speaking out recently over the deportations of uh, just huge numbers of deportations of Afghans, including Afghans who had lived for a very long time in Pakistan back to Taliban. Can you imagine deporting women and girls back to the situation uh, that I described, D deporting people who are uh, members of marginalized uh, ethnic groups back, to, and I didn't even have time to adequately address that issue, uh, back to Taliban Afghanistan. But it's I've been so glad to see the voices in Pakistani civil society to the extent that they you know, have the resources to do so, uh, raising these issues and, and uh, speaking out. I would say in a number of the Central Asian countries, I think uh, the concern is uh, sort of uh, what we're seeing on the part of the governments is um, a lot of move towards kind of economic issues and uh, certain kinds of opening up to facilitate uh, trade uh, in the in the neighborhood and so on. And so I think it's a kind of quote unquote realist um, approach uh, to all sorts of forms of de facto uh, recognition of the Taliban, even though in those countries, whatever the human rights challenges may be in those countries, you know, women and men mix relatively uh, openly. Women have uh, many of the rights uh, that are being denied uh, by the Taliban. And what we're seeing is a great deal of deference by the international community increasingly to sort of the regional uh, players. That, I think, is also partly an, an excuse. Uh, so, you know, when there's policy to be made proactively going forward, the international actors may be happy to lead. But then when there's a mess to clean up, <laughs> they may be happy to sort of argue, oh, this is this has become a, a, a regional uh, problem. Not to say that the region um, isn't isn't important. But I, I want to say that I'm talking about governments and I uh, in particular in, in the case of Pakistan, in particular in the case of, say, Iranian human rights defenders, in, including those in the diaspora who are able to function much more freely. There's been tremendous support for Afghan uh, human rights movements, and I hope that that will be continued and, and be recognized.